Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Cheryl McComsey. She's the founder of Pesticide Free Alberta. She now lives in British Columbia in Powell River. And I understand, Cheryl, that uh, there have been some organizational efforts there to at least uh, try to secure a local food that may not be contaminated with all these chemicals that seem to be everywhere. Yes, actually, Powell River is a really amazing community. Like, um, their uh, farmer's market is, is quite amazing and one of the best on in, in British Columbia. Um, there's also a cooperative called Skookum. Skookum means different things, uh, strong being one of them, and they do all kinds of things as a co-op to increase um, access to um, food for community uh, people. And so one of the things they do, uh, they do all kinds of things, like from picking fruit off trees in this community and uh, donating that to different groups, to enhancing local food production, all kinds of things. Like they, the list of things they do is quite amazing. So I'm kind of excited to be uh, joining up with them. And um, I would say that they're a good example of what communities can do. We were talking about uh, the liberals and conservatives federally don't seem to have any interest whatsoever in improving the quality of our food and water, trying to keep it pesticide, herbicide, chemical-free. Is there any hope for us? Right now, the government doesn't have regulations. It only has guidelines. Yeah, Certainly, there are some groups in Canada who are putting pressure there, but I think Canadians are just misinformed or not even formed, informed at all about how this is working or not working. Um, you know, like Alberta had a change in government, but uh, the NDP government was not really addressing a lot of abuses of regulation before either. Uh, certainly the conservatives are probably not going to be much more hope in that regard, but, um, but I don't think people realize that, you know, even the regulations that we have, they're not, um, they're not put into effect. Uh, I mean, I just even had a comment from someone here in BC that said they saw, you know, young guys spraying pesticides. They had no protection. They have no idea even what they're spraying. They're supposed to be informed about what they're spraying. They're supposed to be protected with, uh, you know, equipment, uh, you know, and they, and they don't even have that. So, you know, it's quite remarkable that we think we have something. We clearly do not. I, I don't really know what the answers are, but I think from the grassroots this is where change happens, and there's a number of organizations across Canada who are trying to address it. You mentioned uh, before we went on air, Kind of a, a bellwether thing, a common plant in British Columbia seems to be struggling to survive. What is it, and what could be the problem? Well, there is a couple of news reports that are quite disturbing, and um, because I'm new to BC, I'm not as familiar with the uh, vegetation here. I'm looking at uh, increasing my knowledge that way. But Salal is a um, pretty hardy plant and forest, and a lot of people have noticed that it's dying everywhere Um all over the place, like on Vancouver Island and all along the main, the mainland on the coast and uh, everywhere. So people are really concerned about it. Um, and when I look at the pictures, it looks so much like herbicide damage to me. But, of course, it could be a number of things. I, I know that we've had a very dry winter, but, you know, we had a dry winter here before. I, I wonder if it's a combination of things. If you've got uh, really dry weather and you're spraying herbicides along the railways and you're spraying it in forests and you're spraying it on farms, the, the volume of glyphosate going into the environment is unbelievable. 
And we are not just seeing that uh, disappear when we spray it. Scientists in Alberta had shown me how this herbicide persists for months and even years. So if you keep adding that to the environment year after year, there are studies that show this is in the rain, so that means it can move. So even if you're not even spraying in that area, um, this herbicide weakens um, the immune system of plants in a variety of ways, one in, in that it damages beneficial fungal organisms and other organisms in the soil. So you weaken the immune system of a plant, you remove some beneficial organisms in the soil, and so maybe perhaps, you know, you'll have fungal diseases. We're certainly seeing fungal diseases increasing worldwide on a scale that's horrific and causing um, disease that's very serious in human beings. Um, I don't know why we think we can put out these poisons and then think they magically disappear and that they don't have any impact on us. They certainly do. We'll have more. We're Cheryl McComsey right after this. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol, PBX, and on the OTCQB symbol, PWWBF, and on Frankfurt symbol, 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerVanSolutions.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Cheryl McComsey. Cheryl, more and more people say they want to move away from eating meat and maybe eat meat-like products that aren't animal-based. How are these things selling, and are they a better alternative to eating, say, organically grown beef? Um, Well, there's a lot of things to say about this. Um, You know, to remove toxins out of your diet is for some people, very expensive. And one way to do that is to go to plant-based proteins like lentils and chickpeas, etc. But again, um, I would access those. Uh, I would go for organic uh, because otherwise you're going to see, you know, a lot of herbicide sprayed in those plants and other pesticides as well. So it makes it more affordable for a lot of people if they go to a plant-based diet. And in general, I think in the past, you know, people really didn't eat meat that much. We're, we're eating a lot of it now and probably too much in, in ways that are not really healthy for us anymore. So there's probably lots of good reasons to at least reduce our meat, many, many different reasons. Um, but So it makes it more affordable for people. You could probably uh, change your diet and find that you can afford organic a lot easier if you're eating plant-based protein. But what my concern would be about this is that, and this has been, um, you know, emphasized by other groups, is that testing has shown high levels of glyphosate, even above acceptable limits, uh, what the government considers acceptable limits on uh, legumes like lentils and chickpeas and, and so on, of glyphosate. So if you're eating some of these burgers we're seeing in these fast food places, and processed food is not all, is not very good for us for, for a, nine, a number of reasons, but you know, the Impossible Burger um, is one plant-based uh, burger that's come on the market that's been talked about quite a bit. Well, there's a doctor that pointed out there's 46 unknown or proteins that human beings have never ingested before in that burger that have not been tested for, for safe human consumption. That would be a concern to me when we look at history and um, proteins that animals are not supposed to ingest and what happens there. We have all kinds of things that happen that are not good. And then the other burger called the Beyond Beef Burger, which is also highly processed, and there's been severe allergic reactions to that burger already, uh, talked about in the media. But again, the pea and the canola in there are going to have a lot of herbicides, pesticides sprayed on them. And, uh, you know, we're not testing for that. So why, why do we 
not consider that uh, if if we're going to go to a plant based um, diet, if it's not organic, um, I wouldn't consider it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go there. It's much better to consider organic in that you're going to reduce your toxins in multiple ways. Of course, organic is under the gun right now, so uh, we want to maintain and uphold this brand by making sure it sticks to its standard. Uh, those uh, beef substitute burgers as well, uh, a lot of them contain methyl cellulose, which a lot of people have a sensitivity to or allergies to. It, is that something people should be aware of as well? Well, I can't really speak to that. I'm not familiar with it, but I know there's a lot of additives that go into food that are that are harmful or bother people. And to be quite honest, I, I know people are, you know, they're really busy, but it, there's lots and lots of recipes for making your own plant-based burger from black beans or chickpeas or what have you on, on the Internet. You can find tons of recipes. If you just make up a huge batch and freeze them, you've got a ready-made burger. Just pop it out of the freezer, warm up in the frying pan. Um, when I've done this, I make, like, you know, two or three dozen burgers and freeze them. And when you're really frazzled on a day and you want something fast, then you've got something fast. It just takes a little bit of planning and it pays in multiple ways. I know myself and I know a lot of people who improve their health in different ways by um, eating better. And this is just one of the ways. Processed anything is, I'm skeptical of how the food is processed. I mean, there's there's methods of extracting things that are in themselves harmful, not even just the ingredients themselves. And it seems to me almost every day there's a recall of some kind of processed food, chicken fingers with salmonella in them and so on. Is that an indication that maybe the more ingredients they have in there to try to make it taste good, that's not the best way to go? Well, factory farmed animals are, you know, they're, it's pretty horrific farming conditions. If you, it, there's more and more um, exposure to that. Then animals are confined in really small spaces. And of course, you're going to have problems with disease with any animal that's confined in a small space. So then you've got to treat with antibiotics and then you have, um, risk of other diseases. So yeah, the risk is going to go up with, with that kind of farming. And then the more processing you do, the more links or weaknesses that you have to potential contamination. I mean, contamination can happen at the farm or it can happen in the processing. So, for sure, um, there's salmonella. Or there was just an outbreak of listeria, I think, in uh, some Atlantic salmon I just saw this morning. And it's being recalled. Um, Atlantic salmon is not actually wild salmon. They're farm salmon. And again, it's the same kind of thing that we're seeing with factory farmed animals. You've got these salmon in pens and, and they're sick. They're not healthy. It's unfortunate that it's not working as well as maybe we would like it to, but it, it, it's not. We don't need to eat as much meat. If we eat less meat, we don't have to have animals, um, produced this way. You can have a lot more small farming operation producing meat for the people who are still eating it. We'll have more with Cheryl McComsey right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Cheryl McKenzie. Cheryl, I read an article that uh, 
proposes that there might be a link between autism and pesticides? Have you seen anything on that? Um, yeah, there's a variety of um, studies that, you know, I mean, a lot of talk about diet and autism, and there's certainly a lot of study going on about gut flora and connections to the brain and other organs in the body, of course, you know. Um, our gut flora is incredibly important, and we're just beginning to learn more about that. Glyphosate, again, damages gut flora, and there's interesting studies about, um, you know, how certain gut flora produce things like serotonin and how it produces, how it breaks down our food and so on. So I've, you know, I've heard people who believe that they um, improve their child's health with going to an organic diet. Um, but some pesticides have an incredible body of science around how harmful they are. Chlorpyrifos certainly has a number of studies. This pesticide is designed to damage the nervous system. That's how it works. So it affects acetylcholinesterase in the body. That's how it works. That's how it kills insects. So, of course, it's going to harm us if we're exposed to it. If a fetus is exposed to it or a young child is exposed to it, along with glyphosate that damages the gut flora, along with all the additives in these pesticides and other pesticides that are probably there, we don't even know what that does. We don't test um, formulations. We always test active ingredients. But when we know that the active ingredient is already going to damage the nervous system and then we add those proprietary ingredients that are not disclosed to us to enhance the way this pesticide works, well, it, there is evidence that this is certainly harmful to children in their development in, in multiple ways. And so, yes, I would say there probably is a link there. If the big political parties aren't interested in giving us uh, better food and water quality, are the Greens uh, any better? Do they have proposals to test and, and bring in regulations? Well, um, I was sort of involved with the Alberta Greens, and I'm looking at getting involved with the Greens in B.C. And certainly, um, I believe that their policies are more in alignment with the general public. I just don't think people give them much credit um, because you just feel that the party's just not but we just saw Nanaimo, um, a Green Party or a Green candidate win in Nanaimo in the election there, quite overwhelmingly, actually. He got 39% of the vote. Um, and then you look in Prince Edward Island and you can see there's, you know, they're the majority opposition there. So I think people are, are starting to see them as a viable option to creating the change that we're looking for. At the same time, though, um, you know, as much as I might appreciate the Greens, personally, I'm going to be involved directly. I'm going to go to those meetings, and I'm going to be involved. So if people really want change, they have to get involved. They have to get involved at the grassroots level. It means investing your time and energy, going to those meetings to see that what you want is put into policy and that what you're voting for, the person that the candidate in your riding is the person that you want. I would not go to one party or another. I would vote for the candidate that represents me. So if that was somebody from the NDP party or from the Liberal Party or even from the Conservative Party, but I don't that would happen, um, I would be supporting that person. But it, unfortunately what happens a lot of times is we're given these prom uh, promises and then when people get elected, they don't follow through. You have to wonder why that happens. So besides getting involved with a party, you you really need to, uh, we need to find ways to make politicians accountable. So um, when they make promises to us, we need to make them accountable to those promises, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, we all remember Jean Chrétien promising to get rid of the GST. For some reason, we still have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, taxes red book. are not a bad thing. What's bad is how they're used. You know, if the taxes are not used to uh, fix your roads or support your education and your health system, 
then and they're and they're used in in ways to support uh, individual companies or corporations instead of the general public, then that's not really democracy anymore. Uh, when we when we have our taxes collected, there's nothing wrong with having taxes. It's how the money that's being uh, collected and how it's being used that matters. So if we're told that our government is, for example, uh, protecting our water, and we clearly see that's not happening, well, we have a right to be outraged about that, and I'd say that's why I've really got involved in multiple ways here, because I don't see our government doing what they say they do. Well, we still have hundreds of Aboriginal communities that have boil water advisories, and we have a government that gives $12 million to the country's third richest family to upgrade refrigerators. What's more important and more helpful for Canadians? More yes. healthful. Yes, exactly. Well, in my opinion, I mean, there's lots of small businesses out there that seem to manage quite well and pay their employees a fair wage and so on. And then you see really big companies that don't think twice to lay off their employees and that they all, they'll pay their CEOs and their executives really good money. So what is it we really value here? Yeah, people in, in Canada still don't have clean drinking water. Do we live in a third world country or, or not? Like it's unacceptable that, that Grassy Narrows is still suffering issues around their water today and that when someone goes to bring this up, uh, Trudeau kind of tells them thanks for their donation. That's just a slap in the face to those people. After decades and decades of, of suffering uh, water contamination and, and seeing the ill effects of that, that's just unacceptable. And it's like a basic need. It's a very basic need. Like, well, well, of course, you a, have the, the head of Nestle saying water is not a right for humans. You should have to pay for it. Yeah. That's why I recommend that people do not contribute to these companies. Um, you know, there's a couple places where Nestle collects water. They're not paying the same price for their water that everyone else is paying. Why not? And then they take that water, and there are no regulations around bottled water, and there's been studies showing um, that pretty much all bottled water has very high levels of plastic pieces in it, not even good for you. Um, so then you have a company that's taking water from a community, not paying for it, putting it in a plastic water bottle, which in itself is an environmental footprint, and then not even necessarily having a product that's even good for you in that water bottle, when we could be buying water filters for our homes if we feel that the water in our communities don't fit our standards. But we should all have clean water that we that we don't need to filter. So that's another issue. Like, I have a water filter where I'm living here. I've had a water filter in Edmonton, and I feel like I, I have better quality water for that. A lot of people can't afford that. Cheryl, anything else you'd like to add to our conversation today? No, just that, um, you know, if you feel as an individual that things are not working as you would like, get in, find a group. There's groups everywhere that are trying to address these problems. Um, and get involved or create your own. Like Skookum here is a cooperative and people got together. It's, it's been around since 2009 and they are just an amazing little group. I'm, I'm so impressed with these people and, and we're not in a big community here. So in places around, uh, you know, Vancouver, I know there's like, there is, uh, community gardens and things like that going on, but there's other things as well and, and people can collectively get together and, and um, improve food for your community, which will improve the health and the general mood of people when they feel good is better. Your whole community is going to be a happier place. Cheryl, are there any websites people can go to to get more information on the things we talked about today? Um, well, like as I've said, we don't really we don't have a website for our group, and. <laughs> Stop the Spray BC is a group in Prince George, and they have been getting a lot of attention. So you could go to their website if you want to learn about 
spraying in forestry and how that doesn't actually work at all and um, how much harm that's creating. So I would recommend people in BC take a look at that group. And then I would look at to see if there's um, food cooperatives, um, the organic um, groups here in BC and organic farmers and farmers markets. Make use of them. We are all at risk of food sovereignty. Uh, there's nations that are suffering flooding and fire and and so on, and we need to support our local organic farmers. Cheryl, thank you so much for chatting with us. You're welcome. Thank you. My guest has been Cheryl McComsey, founder of Pesticide Free Alberta. as She now lives in Powell River, British Columbia. You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.